So, you want to write a multi-layered complex villain? Well, today I thought I would analyze one of the best villains that I have seen and that villain's character growth arc. And the villain in question is Melisan Shaharazai from the Kashil series. Welcome to another episode of Just in Time Worlds with me, Marie Mullaney. If you like this kind of character analysis, let me know in the comments below and I will make more of these style of videos. Also, this is a spoiler warning for all six books of the main Kashil trilogy, so Kashil's Dart through to Avatar and Kashil's and the Kashil Legacy series that follows on from that. I am going to spoil pretty much everything about these books. You have been warned. We first meet Melisande Shaharazai in Kashil's Dart, where she is introduced as a rival of Phaedra's mentor. Phaedra is the main character and narrator. I should mention that Phaedra is a courtesan and a masochist, and Melisande is a sadist. The, there is a sexual tension between these two characters that you can absolutely cut with a knife. And that pun is slightly intended for those of you who've read the books. When you're introduced to Melisande, you don't immediately think villain. But she is very much the villain in book one. Phaedra discovers this when she goes home and finds her mentor murdered. She encounters Melisande in the palace when she's trying to find somebody to report this to. And Melisande takes her captive by putting sleeping potion effectively in her tea. And Phaedra wakes up on her way to Skaldia, having been sold as a slave. So now we know Melisande is a bad guy. Now I'm not going to discuss all the intricacies of the first book's plot. Suffice to say that Melisande struck a deal with a Skaldi warlord in order for Terra de Ange to be invaded by the Skaldi. And eventually Melisande's plan was to become the queen of Terra de Ange and Skaldia. This was her play for power. You meet her as basically an ambitious villain and the architect of this massive plot to take over Terra de Ange. She is captured in book one, but she escapes. That escape sets up the premise for book two. Now, book two is a much more intrigue-focused game. Here, Fedra is going directly head-to-head -head with Melisande in the area of politics. Now, Melisande has escaped, and there are still traitors in Terra de Ange, people who were backing Melisande's play. Phaedra is trying to find those traitors. This takes her on a long journey. Again, I'm not going to recap the whole book. I'm focusing here just on Melisande. What Melisande had done is she had married the queen's uncle, Benedict de la Courcelle. And with him, she had, con she had conceived an heir. Now, they tried to assassinate the queen in order to get Benedict on the throne, but the boy, Imreel, that Melisande had given birth to, was also in and of itself a play because he was a pure-blooded D'Angeline and the queen had married outside of Terra de Ange and had conceived what is called a half-breed heir in some of the books. So Melisande offers her pure-blooded D'Angeline heir against Yassandra's half-blooded Cruthane heirs. Well enough, Phaedra foils the assassination plot and the direct scheme to put Melisande on the throne with Benedict de la Courcelle. At this point, Melisande is forced to take refuge in the temple of Auserat, where she is safe from Terra de Ange because she has taken the veil of Asherat, but at the same time she cannot leave the temple or she is subject to Terra de Ange's authority. At this point, as a reader, you're very much on board with Melisande getting her just desserts. At least I was. I was like, yep, absolutely, she should stand trial for her crimes and, you know, under the justice of Terra de Ange, be shortened by the length of her head. In book Three, which is set 10 years after the event of book two, Melisande contacts Phaedra. Her son, Imreel, is missing. Now, Imreel has been missing in the, from the perspective of the realm of Terra de Ange for 10 years. 
But Melisande knew where he was because she had a priest spirit him away in order to be her last gambit when he turns 18 with his pure blood. But now he has gone missing. And this leads to what is the most transformational perspective on Melisande's character. Because two things have happened here. The first is that her son being stolen away by slavers is a object lesson for Melisande. It is Cashield's justice, and it is enacted using an innocent, her son, because her schemes were paid for by innocent blood. She caused a war that nearly destroyed the nation. And so the gods provide an object lesson by using an innocent that actually means something to her. They steal her son away and cause her to feel that pain of innocence destroyed. It's a beautiful thematic element, and I must admit it made me hate the gods of Terra de Ange just, just a little bit. It, it really was, like, painful. But there is a second thing at play, and that is that a dark power, a divine dark power, is rising in Drujan, the kingdom that lived and died, and Imril's theft is used as a lure to get Phaedra to go to the kingdom that lived and died and to stand against that dread darkness and bring it to an end with the power of love. Again, it is a beautiful story. I'm not going to recap all of it because I'm focusing on Melisande here, but it is lovely. Right at the end, Melisande and Phaedra strike a deal. Phaedra will raise Imril as her foster son and Melisande will make no further plays on the throne of Terra d'Ange. Cool. So Melisande is no longer a threat to the, to the throne of Terra d'Ange. And that brings us to the second trilogy, which is now told from Imril's perspective. Imril is our narrator and our protagonist. Now, he obviously has a great hatred for his mother in the first book. Melisande's hand is felt throughout the two first Imreal books. She has written letters to him, which he eventually reads, and in reading he becomes a more mature man, and he understands that even his mother's story has two sides to it. Yes, her actions are monstrous and huge, but she did have reasons which might not be good enough reasons, but she did have reasons. Imril himself goes from hating her to at least being at peace with her. But he also falls in love with Queen Yassandra's half-blood heir. And his love for her threatens to tear the realm in two because everybody is like, is this a play by his mother? Is his mother's hand behind this? Is he like his mother? Is he actually just playing on the feelings of the whole realm? And will this, you know, result in his mother actually taking power through him? And Queen Yassandra herself sets this limitation. She says to Sidoni, her daughter, she will not acknowledge Imril as Sidoni's lover. And if Sidoni chooses to force the issue by marrying Imril, that's fine. In Terra de Ange, you can marry, marry who you like. But Yassandra will disown Sidoni. And that's the price. But there is a way that Imril can prove himself to Yassandra, and that is by hunting down his mother and bringing her to justice. I should mention at this point that in the first Imril book, Melisande did escape from the Temple of Asherat. I'm sorry, I forgot to mention that when I was talking about it. Apologies. It makes more sense if you understand that. In the first Imreal book, the book opens with Melisande having escaped from the Temple of Asherat and vanished into the wider world. So you are set up to think that this is going to be the conflict of the third Imreal book. And then there comes this tribute from Carthage and... They show this mystical wonder and the whole realm 
forgets that Sidoni and Imreel were engaged, except for Imreel and his enemy called Barkil, Barkil Lenvers. There's a lot of crazy reasons behind it. Again, I'm not going to go into everything. But the long and the short of it is, Imreel now needs his mother's help in order to undo the spell that has resulted in Terra de Ange being in this state. And now we come to the final step of this villainous growth arc journey. When Imreel meets his mother finally, she has learned a measure of compassion. She has learned to not put herself at this level where she plays with people's lives. She has grown a tiny conscience. Now, part of the deal that Barkil and Imreel strike before he even goes to look for her is that her sentence will be commuted from death to exile. But in meeting Melisande in that third book, you, the reader, who've walked this very long path with Melisande, the growth arc is incredible. In the first book, Melisande put herself against the entire nation for her love of politics. Now, 20 years later, Melisande has grown wisdom. And her personal growth arc is one of the most incredible things about these books. She has gone from being somebody you would happily see as getting their just desserts to somebody that you want to see survive, to somebody that you want to see thrive, to, to a character that you, the reader, are now invested in. It was beautifully done. My advice to you, if you want to create a villain like this, a villain that shows a character growth arc, is to, one, take it slowly, and two, remember the hero's journey. Melisande started out as effectively a sociopath. Then she had an inciting event, which was Imreel's birth, which taught her the importance of loving another human, because Imreel was the thing that she loved. Then she went through a trial of troubles where Imreel was stolen away, and she had to make peace with the fact that he would not be raised by her to love her. He would not be a game piece in her play. She was forced to accept that he would grow to hate her. And in fact, she says this at one point where she says, let him grow to hate me, only let him grow up. And then she has to make a choice to help him. Even though he has accepted his role in bringing her to justice, she still needs to help him. And yes, it's a redemption arc of sorts, although I wouldn't say she's fully redeemed by any stretch of the imagination. But it is growth, and that is, the, that is overcoming the trial of troubles, which leads her into having somewhat more consideration for other humans, where she goes from being a complete sociopath to at least having the rudiments of a conscience. And that is my take on a villainous growth arc. I hope that you enjoyed it. If you haven't yet, please do hit the subscribe button, hit the thumbs up button, and I will see you soon for another episode of Just In Time World.